What is up, guys? Welcome back to Title Gardens. I'm here with my friend Will. You have seen his tank several times on this channel, and I thought it'd be nice to actually have like a sit down talk with the guy that actually put the whole tank together and kind of go over the entire system design and kind of like the philosophy behind the setup, as well as some ideas on the future of this tank. Will, first off, thank you very much for for coming. It's been a it's been a whole pandemic since we last saw each other. I am so happy to see you live and in person. It's <laughs> great. It's fantastic. It's nice to actually see other human beings other than the staff here. So it's good stuff. I think there's a lot of reclusivity in the hobby in general. So yeah, yeah, not a shock. No, not at all. Walk me through a little, just broad overview of your tank. Like what what's the size of it and uh, what like you? I know you're using Aqua Forest. This tank, 2016 Reef Savvy, 275 gallons or so, give or take, with the rock and sand and sump. I treat it like a 275 uh, gallon tank, three quarter inch glass, but it's a built-in. Got sort of a mini fish room in the furnace room behind it, which is really nice. I really wanted to do a built-in like that because I wanted to have room to access it and geek out behind the scenes because that's where I spend all my time is not in front of the tank looking at it but rather behind the tank uh, dinking around with the pieces and parts and the processes. This tank sort of based on your original recommendation I started off as a pure aqua forest system. It was dosing the the aqua forest three part the component one two three for calcium and alkalinity and magnesium and all of the all the micro elements I was using their probiotic salt mix at the time. What else? They have a carbon supplement and also bacterial supplements and then various amino acids and all of that good stuff. When I first started the tank, I was running their recommended sort of mix of their own custom zeolite, carbon, and GFO sort of mixture all at once. That's the way the tank started. Today is completely different <laughs> because I'm a tinkerer. I'm constantly messing around with what products I'm using, what supplements I'm using, what method I'm using to try and optimize the thing. So are you um, still using Aquaforest? I use some pieces and parts of Aquaforest. I don't use the component one, two, three anymore because I've got a calcium reactor. Okay. So now I do use their trace element supplements. So they have a component ABC that sort of has the the missing trace elements that are included in the one, two, three, it's called ABC, and you add those once a week. So okay. that I don't need to dose those like using a, a dosing pump, but I add those just to keep the color. I do find that their mix of the, of the trace elements seems to be really good. Everything that I have likes it, and I definitely notice a color difference when I do not dose it. It doesn't grow any differently. It doesn't seem to be any less or more healthy, but I definitely do see a color up when I use their, their, That's interesting. their, their trace. Are, are you by any chance testing for any of the trace elements? I did, you know, I bought the, the Red Sea kit and did a bunch of like micro testing, and but I don't do it anymore. <laughs> I just go by the look of the thing and I just trust their mix. I don't like individually dose iodine or anything like that. It's like, it's all, I just, I use their package solution. I dump in 27 milliliters of each one once a week and that's what I do and it, it does seem to improve the color especially the blues and purples seem to do better when I dose the trace elements but we're deep in the weeds and and trace stuff so what other stuff from aqua forest I still use their aminos and they have a product called energy and build which are obviously designed to one is supposed to supplement the skeletal structure and one is designed to provide carbs and other energy for the corals. I dose those a couple of times a week. I can't really tell whether they do it. The aminos definitely help. The other two, eh, I, you know, I, I can't really tell whether it's they so, do anything. It's so hard to tell if anything's making a difference. And especially if you are tinkering, it's less clear what change was the causation of anything. I'm also afraid to remove things. It's like once I've got something working, to rem I'm scared to remove. So I'll leave them in place, even though I have no evidence that they've actually done anything <laughs> up to this point, but I don't want to take it away for fear of you know throwing off the balance because stability does seem to be important. Well, that's good because because we 
discontinue stuff all the time. The thing that helps us is we have so much video documentation of everything where sometimes you get comfortable with how something looks and we refer back to a video that we shot like six months ago and it's like oh yeah it looked way better right. <laughs> what, 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 have, what have we done differently oh we uninstalled some reactor or we changed salt mix because of x y and z reason or you know what on that tank the calcium reactor hasn't been running properly for months and we just kind of like just let it go because it probably wasn't a big deal anyway that sort of thing i should definitely take more pictures it helps we're very bad at memor remembering I do take notes, but like you said, that visual recall is just... Garbage. Yeah, yeah it's so. like straight garbage. And this is actually a good time to point out that the last time I saw your tank was like a year ago. Right, when you and Becca came over and shot. Yeah, yeah. this will be like a really nice comparison of your tank a year ago versus today. Yeah, I've lost a few pieces, but for the most part, it's just been stuff growing in. That huge purple Monty is massive now. Crazy. It's still there because I, I thought you got rid of a whole bunch of it before. I, I gradually snap off the outer pieces to keep it from taking over the whole tank, but it's, yeah, three to four feet wide. Wow. Yeah, it's huge. I think that there might be like a lot of folks that are just kind of unfamiliar with the entire aquaforce thing. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of funny that you say that like you got a lot of the idea to do that from me because my experience with aquaforce, because I bet the first part of this little uh, video probably sounded like a huge advert for Aqua Forest. Uh, I had a terrible experience with Aqua Forest. I think that the problem that I had with it, though, was I kind of used a couple of things, but not whole hog everything. And I think that when you try to mix methodologies or you have a current methodology and then you decide to switch it up to something very different. I agree, that can really screw That's things That's really, up. really bad. Case in point, when I wanted to dabble with Aquaforest, I was using probably one quarter to one tenth the recommended dosage of the stuff. I shouldn't really even see anything wrong. Right. I shouldn't see anything good or bad. Like nothing should happen wrong. I would say that I lost like 33% of my corals, like a third of it, everything, everything died. I remember you put, you had GFO and carbon. Uh, Which and was the, yeah, that was the recommended, yeah. yeah, and they, but that seemed like to be the major thing that you, that could have thrown off the tank chemistry, because you were using very small amounts of that supplement. Of everything else. Right, but maybe ripping out all of the PO4 all of a sudden, yeah, I don't know, but there was, I remember that that really affected your tank. I suffered the same sort of malignant change in my first tank when I switched from Red Sea to Zeovit like different carbon source, mm -hmm. different bacteria, everything was, ext yeah, I, I probably lost 25% of my stuff. And I think that sometimes when people have issues with like a particular brand of salt or additives and they assume it's because, oh, this new thing is garbage, but it's just the transition of your old thing to the new thing. That alone is enough to cause some serious problems. Yeah, and it's been said a million times in the hobby, slow small changes are what tanks like large sudden movements they, real big bad it does not do well and it doesn't matter what it is you know even if you're heading toward what should be an ideal seawater element makeup of your water if you're currently really low on your salinity and you all of a sudden bang it up to 35 mm -hmm. uh, bad things are gonna are gonna happen to your tank even though that's supposedly the ideal uh, it doesn't matter so it's funny you mentioned that because here um, we sometimes have some fundamental disagreements amongst the staff even about whether you should chase numbers or not. Mm -hmm. Because for me, it's like I would much rather have slightly bad chemistry that stays exactly on that bad chemistry rather than making an effort to change that chemistry to something that looks more ideal because the change itself is bad. And also, like, how much do you really trust your test kits? Just because this particular test kit said that you're low in something doesn't mean it's actually low. It says the test kit said it was low. Yeah, I've learned to not trust individual tests and I cross check now. I have with like, different brands. With different brands and, and get a range. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and I do think, you know, there's clearly ideals for alkalinity and for calcium and stuff. And I totally agree with what you said, which is I'd rather have my alkalinity at 6.3 steady than have it wandering all over the place from 9 to 4 and, and back and forth, even, mm -hmm. even though sometimes 9 may be supposedly better. 
uh, stability does seem to be key. My tank definitely likes it when everything is steady, even if it's not exactly perfect. And that's the basic system. I moved away from the dose pumps because they were so loud. They, they screech. And my son, who uses that room next door to play Xbox and watch movies and stuff. He was he's, hearing it through. He's like, he's like, dad, you, I can't have this. You know, it's like, Rrr. yeah, especially the, the continuous water change because uh -huh. it, it ran relatively frequently. So I replaced those with Kimor. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So, okay. And I'm just, so I, I only have three dosing pumps now. I have one from the calc reactor, two that are doing continuous water change to the tune of about 15 milliliters per minute. And they just run all the time and then just fill up my reservoir when it gets low. Just keep it running. I've got the apex set to turn those off if the salt water uh, reservoir runs out of juice. And uh, and I, I run that continuously. So speaking of water changes, do you then do any other like large periodic water changes? Only if I do a treatment, like if I use cyanoclean or something, okay. something, something like that. I've got a question because you, you're using a lot of... A lot of products that are not made in the U.S. Have you had any issues with sourcing any of this stuff? I did, yeah. Aquaforest had several, and I can't even remember what it was. They had several different carbon dosing solutions. And the one that I chose, which was supposedly their strongest strength once, I purchased. I got it all set up. I had my tank stable on it. And then all of a sudden I couldn't purchase the product, I ran out. And so I had to shift my dosing product and that actually caused some pretty significant problems in the tank at the time. I managed to bring it back, but for two weeks I couldn't get that product. And uh, I do find for myself, if I'm dosing to try and increase the bacterial population in the tank, and then that suddenly changes, all kinds of bad, bad stuff happens. I either get algae growth will happen if there's not enough, or I'll get a cyano outbreak or some other sort of, you know, micro floral related problem if that mm -hmm. changes. So that needs to be stable over time too. And the, the corals really don't like it when those situations change. They, they get used to a particular nutrient level, it seems, or bacteria level in the tank. And then you tinker with it and all of a sudden they're very unhappy. They hide, you know, you'll see no polyp extension for some period of time. So yeah, sourcing was a bit of a problem. Lately, I haven't had any, any trouble. It was strange during the pandemic, everything seemed fine. But I'm using, their, I'm using their very popular products now, not any of their... That was always less, like my, my concern stuff. with some of the... There's some sentiment in the reef industry that there's like an objectively best salt. And it's from Germany. For me, that has a coral farm. We can't be without salt or, or, or anything, really. Like, we need to be able to get everything in large quantities. Are you still Omega One? That... No. Oh, okay, so well, a funny thing about that. They got bought by uh, Spectrum Brands, which owns Instant Ocean. Mm -hmm. And Instant Ocean immediately did away with the, the whole thing, yeah. that, that whole product. I use Instant Ocean now. That's, what I, that's my primary. Oh, you use Instant Ocean now. Okay. All right. Let's talk about Instant Ocean real quick because... <laughs> I switched from Omega C to Instant Ocean. That lasted, no joke, three weeks tops. Because. Were you using the reef salt or the sea salt? I was using the sea salt, the Instant Ocean, not reef crystals. Not reef crystals. Okay, are not. you using reef crystals? Yes. Okay. So I am now currently using reef crystals because I was under this impression that most salts are trying to be more or less the same thing. They're trying to like mimic ocean water. You know, it's, you, you guys have the si similar goals for all these different salts, right? Right. They should be pretty close. And I think that a lot of the, 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 the drama and conversation online, I think is largely overblown. But anyway, I switched to Instant Ocean. And then we noticed that calcium and magnesium were chronically low. It was a noticeable difference in these large systems, which is like really messed up. Hmm. We had to then, you know, supplement for magnesium and calcium. We didn't want to go through that two-step process, so we eventually then switched from Instant Ocean to Reef Crystals, and things are better now. Then it occurred to me, like, duh, Instant Ocean sells to every major, like, public aquarium. 99.9% .9 of that public aquarium is not a reef system. They don't have live corals. Sharks Fish only, yeah. don't care about magnesium and calcium. That, that penguin exhibit does not care. Sham, like, you know, Shamu does not care 
a bunch of calcium level. Right. They just need salt water. And IO is perfectly okay cutting costs on those non-reef related things. I should have known better. Yeah, I'm pretty known. I'm pretty happy now. I did try the sea salt. I had mixed results with it, but I switched away from the aquaforest because the aquaforest was the primary reason that I was using it was for the probiotics that were built in, but then I decided to do continuous water changes and mm-hmm. the probiotics they dissipate. They just die. They just die. There's no point. You need to use it freshly mixed. And I I tried several of the other salt mixes, including your best German brands. Uh, but I, they, I don't know why we're not mentioning it. It's, we're talking about Tropic Marine. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> but the, it left a residue in my uh, oh, in, in my mixing tank. Uh, and so did Red Sea. I didn't like this brown crud, like all over everything. And the tubing that I'm using, you know, it's standard like RO tubing. It was starting to get you know, like clogged up mm. uh, on the at the inlet points. Uh, but I haven't had any problems with Instant Ocean. That has been great for the continuous water change system. So I've always heard that reef crystals is dirty and it mixes dirty and leaves a residue but coming from omega uh omega left like straight up flakes Mm. like giant sludge piles which by the way it took us about three days almost to have it completely clear versus about four hours for the instant ocean products so people saying that you know that reef crystals is dirty like Mm. it's (laughs) fine it's like I'm, i'm loving life right now I've got a little mixing station, and if I run it for an hour, it's clear, and I never have any residue problems, so I've yeah, been lucky with that. I'm fine with it. Not to say that other folks haven't had some residue problems, but my stuff is looking clear. Yeah, that's awesome. But that's another thing, and you bring up a great point. I used to be one to give advice in the hobby, but I've found that there are a million ways to skin the cat, so to speak. There are a variety of ways to get excellent results. And just because it's working for me doesn't mean it's going to work for you or anybody else. So I'm very reluctant now. (laughs) People ask me exactly what you're doing and I'll I'll tell them, but I'll say your results may vary. Your results are going to vary. Because I have no idea what's going to happen in your tank. For me, it's just been very much a process of, oh, I, I can make incremental improvements in my system and my methodology to the point where I'm happy with it. And that's all that I can claim to have done in this hobby is do that over time. And I I can't say that I have some secret method that's going to work for everyone because I I definitely don't. It just happens right now. And that could change next week. It just happens right now to be working for me. The other thing that that I think is also kind of funny when it comes to like how replicable results are not only would it be entirely possible for folks to try to replicate what you do or what I do and have completely different results, sometimes better, sometimes worse, but also it's very easy for us to not communicate some little wrinkle as to what we're actually doing. And it's also really easy for the other person to think that they're doing what it is we're doing, but are totally not. Because it's almost like when a dentist asks you, are you flossing? And you're like, yeah. Have you really been flossing? You've flossed three times in the last year, but you remember those three times. So you say, yes, I floss. Right. Or making grandma's biscuits. She forgot to tell you that she needs it for two minutes after she mixes it. There's just all kinds of little pieces in the puzzle that are, as you said, very, very easy to miss when communicating them. And even if you do communicate it effectively, did the other person actually understand what you said? And can they actually replicate it in the same way that you it's unlikely, you know, that, which is why that's one of the joys of the hobby, though, because I'm more of a process guy than a, someone who's like really into understanding what every single organism is. In my t- Some people are really into, into naming or in, mm-hmm. into the, you know, the entomology of the whole thing. Great. That's part of the hobby. There are people that are really into, you know, different styles of tanks and pre- presenting and aquascape. It's like, eh, kind of, I'm into the process. I love to tinker with chemistry, with making the stuff grow, with creating a habitat. That's the part of the the hobby that I really, I, like I'm the type of kid who when I was, you know, three years old would sit and watch the washing machine through its entire cycle. And my mom's like, kid, you need to like go, <laughs> like get a life. But, but I was fascinated with things like that. You know, I want to see the whole process all the way through. Now I understand, now that I've seen it all the way through, now I understand it and, okay. can, and manipulate so, it. So speaking of that manipulation, this is a perfect segue into the whole substrate thing. A while ago, like this is probably two years ago, your tank had a substrate. Yep. One year ago, 
your tank did not have a substrate. Had nothing. And now today, your tank has a substrate again. Yes. So let's so talk me through what what's that all about? Well, when I first put the tank together, I decided I wanted a sand bed, both for aesthetics as well as for supposedly providing additional surface area for bacteria to grow and habitat for grasses. And I have a conch and all my sandy stuff. Well, that was great and it worked out for a while, but then I actually made the mistake of like starting to remove some of the sand because it was getting too deep in spots. And so I pulled out a, a couple of buckets full of sand and it was disgusting. Even though I had been vacuuming the sand on a very regular basis with my python, you know, getting mm -hmm. in there and doing water changes and stuff. I pulled this out and I think I even sent you pictures of it. It was, it was just the most disgusting thing. It smelled horrible. And I was like, this is, this can't be good for the tank. I can't really get this tank clean. So I siphoned it all out. And when I was done, I looked at the tank. I'm like, wow, this is pretty cool and it's going to be easy to keep clean mm -hmm. and that was true my leopard wrasse had no place to hide and eventually died i had sort of left a little corner but it wasn't enough for it the conch doesn't care as it turns out but what i found was that there's actually still a significant amount of maintenance that you have to do with a bare bottom tank and i really didn't like the look of it in the end you know, i would sit in the other room and like imagine myself being you know, a new visitor to the room and check it out. I'm like, eh. just the way the tank is constructed, it's got reinforcements around the side and it's got a like sort of bare, it's not really designed to be a bare bottom tank. Mm -hmm. I decided to go back to substrate, but this time I was going to go with basically just enough to cover. Just like a dusting. Just a, yeah, just enough to cover the surfaces. And it, so it's much easier to keep clean. The substrate's only been in there for probably six months. I still get, and I think from the silicates and the, in the sand itself, I still get a little bit of a dusting of diatoms or sometimes cyano, just okay. stuff that is gradually fading, but it's so much easier to keep clean. I like the cross in between the two the best. I don't want a, you know, a two inch sand bed, nor do I want a bare bottom. The ideal for me is just enough for aesthetic that keeps it easy to keep to keep clean and actually hides the debris that would that really show up in a bare bottom tank so mm -hmm. i can go through with my vacuum now and like get it all very quickly uh, i don't even do a water change when i do i just throw a filter in the sump vacuum it out and it's good to go and i'm i'm happy with that solution right now that could change any moment you know <laughs> based on whim but that's what i think it looks the best and is the easiest to maintain the two guys that I got working for me, Luke and Ben, they throw a revolt every single time I even talk about putting substrate. Into <laughs> they were bare bottom, bottom guys. They're, they're bare bottom, 100%. They, they're like, everything will fail if we put a substrate uh -huh. in this thing. And I'm like, listen, children have made this work. Mm -hmm. Stop being a bunch of silly babies about this. <laughs> it's just a substrate. It's fine. When I had like a personal home aquarium, I never once had a bare bottom tank. It always had a substrate. Yeah. And they were, they're, it's fine. It's fine. And they don't siphon substrate here anyways. So I don't even know what they're complaining about. <laughs> anyway, internal tidal gardens politics. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. We're gonna have to have a discussion with Ben about that. Oh, they're so they're so whiny. We can, we can sit. We'll have like a crossfire discussion <laughs> about uh, about substrates. So Becca's tank is going to be uh, separate from all the other systems, and she has decided she's going to have a substrate. So it's like, hey, the queen has decided there's going to be a substrate in this tank. I rent, by the way, I rinse that stuff for a good half an hour. This is the Fiji Pink Carib Sea. On my tank, I recommend a heavy duty rinsing before. Okay, you yeah, we, I, I usually rinse it. Yeah, because it comes in pretty cloudy if you don't, which I guess is fine. It's just fines from the aragonite, but yeah, you know. okay. Let's move on to some of the equipment related stuff because mm -hmm. people people love to like okay the gear. I, I, enough talking about the tank and the <laughs> animals let's talk about the gear that's what this hobby's really about it's about the gear <laughs> okay so let's start at the top what do you have lighting this aquarium I have I have two GTI Sun Power Pros which is the hybrid system ATI rather sorry I should know this. Uh, it's been a while since I installed it. These are ATI SunPower Hybrid LED T5 combinations. So each with eight bulbs, and then they both have two uh, LED clusters in them. So that's a ton of light then. 
it's a lot of light, uh, but I love the T5 and the LEDs are basically there just for shimmer and look. You know, if I had to do it over again, I don't, I don't know if that I would get these just because the, the controls work on them. The old ones actually had a control panel on the unit itself. These, they're Wi-Fi based and the only way to control these is to switch your Wi-Fi network to the Wi-Fi of the lamp itself. And it's actually kind of a hack interface. I've got it set now the way that I like it and I never tinker with it, but it, it's not a very, and I find the Europeans are really, really bad at web uh, interfaces. So uh, and this is a particularly bad one. <laughs> it's really bad. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna even the playing field just a little bit. I'm pretty unhappy with any aquarium related to anything software. Yeah, I don't. I don't love any of them. No, I think that's for the, even Apex is because we use a whole bunch of different ones here, and uh, I can tell that it's not Google or Apple programming. Yeah, no, no, definitely. I was all Neptune Apex for a long time and had everything basically plugged in and controlled by the central computer, and now I've gone back to sort of distributed control. So the lights are controlled you know, by the stuff that's built into the ATI sun power unit. My heater is actually controlled by a FinTech external. And the reason I do that is because I have that plugged directly into a backup. So I want that on the backup system. And if the Apex goes down, I want it to be controlled. The only thing really that the Apex is controlling anymore is just the on and off of the pumps. And that's pretty much it. I, and the, and the, I have the Camors plugged in too, just so I can switch them off if, uh, if the reservoir runs low. So it's really funny that you say that, you're, that you've decided to go with a more decentralized approach because in a weird way, the industry as far as control goes is getting, it's almost like the, uh, like the streaming wars online where every single content house for the streaming services has decided to like have their own ecosystem of shows yeah that's kind of happening to, to some degree with the devices in this industry before a controller company wanted to be able to control every device but then they started to make their own device and then that kind of like angered some other third-party oem and that third-party oem starts to like make a, their own controller that controls more stuff than just their devices. And, and then they get pissed and they're like, we're not going to play in your ecosystem. Yeah, so no more APIs for anybody, right, that like, sort of thing. And so you do have like this silo effect that's currently going on with all these brands that used to work with each other fairly well. And at this point, I don't think any of them work together. No, a lot of them don't. Yeah, it's terrible. I mean, Apex controls a lot of stuff, but again, I really don't use it. I, you know, I've got my probes plugged into the Apex so I can look right. at my numbers. I think that's cool. So I know if my temp is off and I can, it'll alert. I love that feature about the Apex is that, you know, if a number is off, if my temp is too high, it'll send me an email. If it's clear that my salinity is dropping because my ATO system has gone haywire, it will email me. So that part, I love the safety of it. If my power goes out, I want my return, uh, which is an abyss, and my heater to both be on an independent system and just running off the battery backup and basically everything else is shut down. I don't need lights. I don't need anything. So I run those independently with, and the Abyss has its own controller. By the way, um, that might be my favorite pump company. Period. Yeah, that's really good. I love that thing. I like the controller too. Um, it's pretty good. Yeah. I mean, for what it is, I used to love to have everything in my fingertips so that I could screw with it. Now I'm like, I just want to get it like right to the right level and then make sure that it stays that way for stability's sake. So I really don't I'm not in Apex every day screwing around with stuff. When I tinker, it's like I make a little move and I wait for two weeks to see what's going to happen as opposed to, you know, it used to be I would move stuff uh, around all the time. And because of that, it's not like I need to manipulate it from my office. If I'm going to make a small move, mm -hmm. I consider it. I make my change. And then when I put in my new calcium reactor and I needed a larger size, I needed more media. When I installed it in the middle of, <laughs> of dinner one night, my salinity dropped by a point and a half because I took the media out, all the water, because I forgot to shut off the valve at the bottom, all the water from the cal calcium reactor leaked all over the floor. And I lost probably, I don't know, six, seven gallons of water. And of course, they came back out refreshed with fresh water. So my salinity went down as a result. So now I'm gradually bringing it back up by just 
not draining water from the continuous water change system and just adding salt water and it oh it just adds the top it off. just it just tops off mm -hmm. gradually and so my salinity is gradually rising and then when it hits the point that i want it to be at then i'll stabilize it there but that's the type of change that i do now it's just very sort of slow and yeah, yeah even when there's a mess up yeah the remedy is not i'm not going to go right back uh no that's i find that that it never works well. And I kind of gone back to liking the tactile stuff, like the Camores. I don't even use their web interface. I just turn the dial, mm -hmm. you know? I want 15 milliliters a minute. I turn the little dial to 15 milliliters a minute. I want the Abyss to run at 90%. I push the little buttons until it says 90% on there. That's it, as opposed to having this web interface with all these controls on it. My mentality has just changed. I've got to kind of have a funny story about certain products and talking about tactile interfaces. I got a, a unit from GHL a controller, mm -hmm. and a lot of their products have capacitive touch. And okay, I really like GHL, but that one thing has me triggered off this earth because their capacitive touch, for whatever reason in this building, it's getting interference from something and we don't know what. Hmm. So these buttons activate on their own. Oh, that's not good. There's actually a calibration for the capacitive touch. And I'm like, why couldn't it just be a button? Right. <laughs> just make it a physical switch for make it God's a sake. physical button that's wired Clink. to a thing. I hit the button and it <laughs> does something. Right. No. Mm. It's, a, it's this capacitive touch nonsense. Any brand out there that's like designing products, never do this. Put a physical button on there, please. And I like the physical buttons. But anyway, where were we on equipment? So yeah, as I said, I've got a calcium reactor, which is a reef octopus mm -hmm. my sump is a now out of business vertex mm -hmm. um, complete system i think they called it the supra c it was rated for 200 gallons which i didn't care are you happy with the size of it yeah it's fine for the stuff that i have it i still have room to put more stuff but all i have in it right now it has a built-in media reactor for carbon which i run like about a quarter full of GAC, and then the protein skimmer that's granular activated carbon for those folks out there that don't know what that is <laughs> and i like the pelletized kind in that reactor i can have a little sponge that it pushes it down i don't like it to tumble to, yeah to carbon is not supposed to tumble yeah so i, I press mm -hmm. it down and it's like the but the reactor is only quarter i don't run the full amount of carbon in there and then my skimmer is in there and that's the only equipment that's in there the abyss the skimmer the media reactor and then the rest is just empty space and probes and is that the only media that you're running you're not running gfo nope or anything it's just activated carbon exactly at one time it was zeovit and then it was the aquaforest zeovit you know zeolite solution that they had along with their carbon supplementation and bacteria and I've gotten away from all of that. And now I just dose Vibrant once every two weeks. It's oh, sort, okay. of, sort of half the amount. It's got a vinegar sugar solution. It's got the traditional sort of vodka method. And then it also has bacteria in it. Mm -hmm. And I do the water changes. And that's my only bacterial supplementation now. Hmm. And I don't do any, you know, I used to do the, uh, the Red Sea, no pox. And then I did the Aqua Forest version of that, but I've gotten away from all of that and I've been happy with the Vibrant. The problem that I was having, uh, I think that I was actually getting my nutrients too low because I would continually have cyano problems. I know that I'm at the right balance when the algae disappears and the cyano disappears. Right in that range is the ideal nutrient range for a saltwater tank. If you're too low, you start to get cyano. And dinos and stuff and, like that. And dinos and stuff like that. And if your newts are too high, then you start to get algae growth of various various kinds. I try and try and keep algae, so, bryopsis, right. So if I start to get a green fuzz, then it's like oh, it's time for a little more vibrant. If I'm starting to get a little bit of red from the cyano is starting to come out, then it's like oh, I need to back off. For me, that's sort of my own visual indicator of what's going on in the tank, whether my nutrient levels are right. Do you have uh, an idea of what your nitrate and phosphate levels are currently? Mm -hmm. What are they? I, I can't <laughs> tell you that. <laughs> um, right now, my, my nitrates are at five. My phosphates, which I haven't measured in a long time, every time I've ever tested them, have been zero. So zero z phosphate. Zero, it, with the test kits that are now, it's probably not actually zero but i've never been able to 
get okay. it, it, even on the Red Sea test, which is supposedly very low level. I've never never been able to get a detectable amount. So I'm curious, what is in your system that would give you zero phosphates? Uh, just just as far as like a system design, because we're talking about a tank that has a substrate that does not run GFO. Yep. Are you feeding heavily? No. Are you, are you feeding light? Would you say? No, medium. Yeah, I feed three times a day, but I've never in this tank ever had measurable phosphates. And now the last time I tested was probably a year ago, but up to that point I was testing like very regularly and I'm like, I'm just tired of this because I'm like, oh, colorless. <laughs> it's like there's okay. no, there's no, and my nitrates were, would swing widely, but phosphates always seem very stable and very low. What are you feeding three times a day? Uh, Hikari, the Marine S pellets. I have it on an automated feeder. Oh, okay. And a relatively small amount just to feed the fish, and they love that stuff. No frozen food? No frozen food right now. You know, I had that copper band that died. I think it's, you know, once all the Aptasia were gone, it would eat, and I would get it to feed off of Rod's food and you know, various frozen shrimp, but it, it either got a disease or whatever, wasted away. Since he died. It's all pellets. It's easier. It's consistent. The fish, and I haven't had a fish die since I've been doing that, but I also don't have anything really exotic. Probably my most sensitive fish is the powder blue tang, and it's not, you know, they just get some diseases, but I haven't had any trouble at all. Everything, everything else is pretty low maintenance. I'm not an exotic fish sort of Uh I'm not either guy. because mm -hmm. uh, fish die. Yeah. And I don't they disappoint be... you always. Yeah. They disappoint there, always. There's a local store here that has a ghost tang, one of those yellow tangs that are like all white. They're asking like four to six grand for it. And I could probably swing a deal to get one. But it's why? like, why? This thing is guaranteed as soon as I get it, it's going to be dead. I know the exotic fish, I, I, you know, I think the fish are cool and I enjoy them, but I'm not into like super exotic fish. Doesn't Not my thing. So you have LASIK surgery, right? I, I did get LASIK. Okay, so where, where I was going with that is the happiness that I got from getting LASIK for about four grand is like, that's like peak happiness for dollars spent. Yes, I think that's probably true. Yeah. And I think that spending that same amount of money on a fish is the opposite end of the spectrum mm. as far as like that goes. Do you have any issues with pests? Uh, and well, now that my copper band is gone, of course the Aptasia crop up now, little punks. Do you have like vermitted snails? I do, and I hate the little bastards. I mean, it's been a year. There's no get, there's no getting rid of them. I even bought a laser to try and like laze them out to no avail. You know, the worst part, they don't seem to harm the corals. They're yeah. just ugly. And they have a tendency to grow up right in the middle of a nice coral patch. And they put their webs out and the webs are fine. But what happens is they eat and then they leave their disgusting debris like all over your core, especially anything that's plating, they'll leave a little pool of vermited dust all over it. It's disgusting. And I've got little asterinas that are a pain. Mm -hmm. um, the vermitids are the worst, and there's no getting rid of them. I've just learned to, to deal. I, I, I bought live rock. And you it was know, a I, I can always tell how long somebody's been in the hobby based on their attitudes towards pests. Because you've been in the hobby for, what, 30 years or something? Yeah, it's been a lot since the late 80s. Yeah. yeah, I can always tell when somebody freaks out when they get an Aptasia in their tank or they get an Asterina. Because it's like anybody who's been in this hobby for any length of time will get all three of these things. Yeah, there's no, there's no game. Well, I remember at the very beginning, I was excited about these things like, oh, a starfish. I didn't even know that I had starfish. And then you go and research online and everyone's like, Oh, that's an asterina. You got to get rid of. You got to immediately eliminate all those. And you're like, oh my god, I got to get rid of I'm all these immediately. That's a mantis shrimp. That's really cool. Oh no, it's killing all my no. fish, and I got to get rid of it. I remember like stores used to sell Aptasia as anemone rocks back in the day. Isn't that nice of them? I once bought a piece of live rock that had an Aptasia because I thought that I was getting over. Like it's like, oh wait, this one has a has an anemone on it. Yeah, it's so cool. Yeah. Uh, even the copper band, we keep them under control. But I was new. They're under a rock somewhere in there. They're still there. I looked in my overflow box the other day, and I don't normally like go through. I clean it out once in a while. I look in the corner. There's like 20 of them. 
They're yeah. all they're all pale because they're not in the light. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter. It can survive anywhere. I pretty much guarantee in everybody's plumbing. They're just in there. The amount of quarantining we do just to get stuff into these uh, new systems, it's pretty intense. It's like 72 days. And we we kick out anything that we see that even looks suspicious and still stuff can get through. Luckily, the stuff that's really bad, because I I consider like Vermittids, Asterina Stars, and Aptasia, those are like C-list pests. They're they're like annoying. But there's like certain, certain pests are, it's time to start your tank over. Yeah, yeah. And luckily, knock on wood, those have been excluded so far by our processes. If anybody ever says that, like, my tank does not have Aptasia. You're a liar. Or just incredibly naive. Yeah. Because it's like, they are so much better at getting into your tank and surviving than you are at keeping them out or killing them. They're incredibly yeah. good at surviving. My last tank had Aptasia. I've, I've never had the Vermitids before. I made a mistake on this tank, but it's fine. Yeah, like you said. It's, it's an annoyance more than I, Yeah, I, I've been lucky. I, and I'm not a, I am not at all disciplined about quarantine. You said you're going to give me a frag today. I probably will take it home and I'll dip it and I'm going to stick it right in there. You know, it's like I don't have, yeah. I'm not going to go through some long quarantine process with it. It's just not going to You know, but. most people don't. And I think that if people were really serious about like, I can't have any pests in my tank. It's like, do you have a quarantine? No. Yeah, it's like, it's like I have serious. zero weeds in my garden. It's like, like how se- well that and also how serious are you really if you don't yeah. have a quarantine? Yeah, because well. we have a quarantine and it still did, it doesn't prevent everything. <laughs> but yeah, it's, yeah, it's a tough I, one. I mean, if I had a farm like this, then I, I most definitely would. Prefer- it's still tough. It's still yeah. very tough. What are your future plans? Are you like looking to try some new stuff? Are you thinking about? Doing another tank because I remember you had a smaller tank at one point. I did. And I got rid took of it. it down. No, my goal with this one is to keep it as stable as possible and grow it out until it looks like a show tank. That's my goal. And until I've got it really where I want it, I'm not going to add another tank. Now, I did think about doing a micro at my office, like a single coral globe nano that gets a you know 90 percent water change twice a week you know that, that type of tank with a simple lighting system and something something that's very easy growing but with I, john o anemones yeah mm. well it's it's perfect because it's like it's it's a pest they're pretty they look like little bubble tips they are easy to grow yeah. you're not going to kill it at the office no guaranteed <laughs> that's probably the direct app you know people are into the they're into the jellyfish and stuff now. It's like, I always want coral tanks. It, always in the end, that's what I like. That's that's what I want. That's what I think is the prettiest and coolest. So it, if I do do another tank, that's what it would be. But I really want to grow this one out even further than it is. And I'm pretty happy with where it's gone now. Well, that pretty much wraps it up for this conversation. Thank you so much for taking the time to come and chat with us. Hope you guys got something out of this conversation and learned a little bit. If you have any questions, please, by all means, toss it into the comments below and we can continue the discussion there. Well, thanks for having me, Than. I really appreciate it. Awesome. All right, guys. Happy reefing. Take care.